So the hustle and bustle of Savile Row continues every day. We are right in the centre because today we are visiting Huntsman, one of the most august, certainly one of the older tailors in all of London. And we're going to have a look at specifically what it is that has contributed to the longevity of such an iconic British brand. If you go into a tailor of Savile Row, the tick-tocking of the grandfather clock, as I call it, is the soundtrack to any of these august institutions. And there is no grandfather clock that tick-tocks louder and more augustly than Huntsman. Huntsman was established in 1849. For the mass geniuses out there, that means it is 175 years old this year, if you're watching it in 2024. So, there are celebrations to be had, but why has it survived so long? Well, Huntsman have been one of those places that have been able to adjust itself and adapt uh, to the changing of the climate within Savile Row and the way men dressed in general. Huntsman have been also pioneers in terms of dressing women. So at the very early days of Huntsman, you would see people like Queen Victoria, Coco Chanel, Adela Stair, um, wonderful, chic, amazing women being dressed by a men's tailor. Huntsman didn't actually open here until 1911. At that point, it was establishing itself certainly as the equestrian tailor that it was, but also as a city tailor. What it didn't do as much of was military tailoring, but that all changed in the First World War when Huntsman would make clothes for officers and soldiers uh, who were going to the front line. Indeed, one such officer ordered white tie from Huntsman to be delivered to his POW camp in Germany. To understand Huntsman after the Second World War, you have to understand something that happened during the Blitz in London to a young man named Colin Hammock. During the Blitz, thousands of young children were evacuated from London for safety reasons. Young Colin was billeted with the tailoring family. When it was safe to return, he came back and applied for an apprenticeship at Huntsman, which he didn't leave until he retired in 1994. Now, in terms of your understanding of Huntsman, what happens when you come in here, Colin Hammock did two things. Number one, he really established it as a place that does good ready-to-wear. Raised wear and tailoring was considered the bete noir of all Savile Row brands for, for, for decades. Everyone was hesitated to go into it because it's, they, people were worried that it kind of muddied the waters of pure bespoke. It didn't do that, and Colin Hammock was the one who made it completely acceptable. Number two, he established the house cut. The house cut was entirely based on the heritage of Huntsman, but what he did was cut it in a way that remained relevant, interesting, sexy, in a world that was going through the enormous changes in terms of music, art, cinema, everything was shifting. And he found a way of making sure that tailoring remained relevant within that. If you come in here and ask somebody about the house style, they'll show you the hacking jacket. The hacking jacket is what the heritage of Huntsman is largely based on. It is a equestrian style of jacket. You will note this by the slanted pockets. So the slanted pockets need to be there so you can get your hands in your pockets while you're sitting in the saddle. The single button fastening is the place where all the balance of the jacket is held. So it's a very complex thing for a tailor to be doing. So it's a little bit showing off, but it's like ballerina going on point. It also has the strong military shoulders. And one, something that Colin Hammock did was create a kind of proud, broad lapel. Something I think that a lot of people shied away from. People go with the sort of three and a half uh, inch lapel, but he wanted to make it a bit bolder. Why did he do that? Well, it was the 1970s. In the 1970s, everything, proportions were going huge. So what he did was sort of find that middle ground that allowed customers to feel like they were remaining traditional, you know, getting that proper British tailoring, but at the same time, remaining relevant. Now, tailors do come in all shapes and sizes, but there is an archetype, and Huntsman is probably the great archetype. As you can see, it's ornate, 
it's old fashioned, it has the royal warrants on the wall, it has a sense of its history, a sense of its heritage. Now the great thing about somewhere like Huntsman is there is a workshop downstairs where everything is made in house. So if you order a suit from here, you will all, everything that gets done down here. Anyone who's interested in environmental friendliness, sustainability, uh, ethical working practices, this really is the zenith of that. And it, it's baked into the deal ultimately because the carbon footprint is literally walking downstairs. Before we go down, just a quick flip into here because for anyone who loves their movies, this is the Kingsman fitting room. And it's cool such because when you would have watched the Kingsman movie, it's basically all based on Huntsman. And in fact, Matthew Vaughan, who directed the film, was a client of Huntsman. And it was here at a, during a fitting where he kind of conceived of the idea of something happened behind the scenes at a tailor. So this is why they've dedicated this room to the film. But I want to show you further down here. This is where the undercutters are preparing things like paper patterns and they are what's called striking. Striking is when you put chalk on wool um, for cutting. So that will all be done here. At that point, it will get put together and your first fitting will be what's referred to as a base fitting. When you have the base fitting, it's a fairly rudimentary thing. It's largely for the cutter to understand balance, to understand whether it's, it's it, the initial cut and the rock of eye that's put onto uh, cutting clothing is working for your body shape. Once that's done, it then goes to the forward fitting, which is the second fitting to make sure that it's all kind of coming together. You'll still have lots of base stitching on there, but soon enough, you will emerge with a finished product. The man who's gonna be largely responsible for this kind of achievement, this, this final product, the thing that you've been putting a huge amount of investment into in terms of time, but also money, is Dario Carnera. Dario, how lovely to see you. Nice to see you. Sir. I'm gonna come in behind you, because yeah, he's working hard. Uh, Dario is the head cutter of Huntsman, uh, alongside Campbell Carey. And uh, the fun thing about Dario is that he made this. So <laughs> I thought I would wear him to come and speak to him. So it's nice to see you. And you, sir. Now. Looking very smart, I must Thank you very much. <laughs> now, one thing that's interesting about Huntsman and, and, and crucial about it, it's a really a, an intrinsic part of its character and its heritage, is its use of tweeds. So this is why we went for this particular item. Now, uh, as you can see, it's not a hacking jacket, as I was talking about the house style earlier, because I really only wear double-breasted. So when I spoke to Dara and I said, look, if we're going to go do something together, first thing you said ultimately was tweed. Second thing was the house tweed. Now this is what's referred to as the Peck 62. It's the original house tweed for Huntsman. So Gregory Peck was a great client of Huntsman's and he went to, was Johnson of Elgin? Yes, well, Anthony's son came with us. So uh, the original cloth was made at Johnson of Elgin. Yes, yeah. exactly. So he, went, he designed, he, well, he, con he conceived of that and yes. you had that remade because it, it kind of disappeared in, yeah. as a fabric, it, it, it ran yeah. out but uh, you sort of reverse engineered it to some extent. We did, well it was found, um, his son Anthony um, still holds a lot of his father's clothes and we go through every so often and find little gems of which this was one and we took it with us and went back up to Johnson of Elgin and uh, luckily they hold a very large archive of uh, tweeds and we were able to even though we managed to find most of what we needed we still had to sit and dissect the yarns and I think we ended up with a card of about 18 different color yarns on there that go into this. Yeah so, and I mean the, the, hence why it looks so amazing and the uh, one of the kind of um, USPs of Huntsman is that uh, pattern matching is absolutely essential to, to, to the final product. They need it, they want the checks to be matching, both for tailoring as well as aesthetic reasons. Now, one thing I just want to show you before we move on is, this is the original of that. So the, this, is, this was Gregory Peck's, he had this made, what, 1962? 1962, yeah, hence it being called a Peck 62 now, yeah. So as you can see, they've done extremely well of kind of matching what it was. Uh, I, I love wearing it. We had some really beautiful little details put into it. For example, this patrol bag. That was your idea. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We, we put a little detail on there and <laughs> we made the seam a bit raised to make it a bit more. And the patrol bag, of course, has its riding and equestrian heritage, That's, just like yeah. Huntsman. Yeah, it's, it was known as a body coat. So essentially it's more close fitting and, and made for freedom of movement 
and, yeah, and practical use, essentially. See, now I don't use it for riding, but I do like the compliments that it gets. Uh, Huntsman, uh, as I say, it's 175 years of, 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 of really becoming these sort of masters on Savile Row. And it, it, I've always referred to it as the sort of head boy. It's like captaining the All Blacks being the head cutter, a uh, huntsman, you know. It, it, it's just, it's, it's a great honor. And uh, knowing you is a great honor because, you know, you are, um, you know, meeting anybody who's the best in their profession is a great thing. And, well, um, I'm very lucky as well to, to be given this opportunity to do this. Uh. Excellent. And just to sort of give away my figure to, uh, the watch. Um, you and I spoken at length about the shorthand for tailors. Yes. What What do you think is one of the eyes that you noticed in terms of your rock of eye? What did you notice on me? Well, you got a, a little bit of HF. HF. <laughs> I don't know what HF is. is. Probably is down to you being taller than most people you come across. So we, it's head forward slightly. <laughs> the, 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 the the dip at the neck, the yeah, nape. So yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which, as you can see, I do have. It's which a, is different to an RB, which is a round back. <laughs> so okay. There, so not only uh, like people with a round back will also have a slightly forward head, but for a different reason. So with the, it goes down to quite minute when we take people's figuration right. into account. Slope shoulders. <clears throat> Uh, or drop shoulders, I should say. Drop shoulders. Well, there's slope shoulders and then there's drop shoulders. Slope shoulders are where both shoulders are, are quite... Because everybody's shoulder slope is different as well. Yeah, yeah. And that will differ from one side to the other as well. I think my right is lower than my left as well. You've got so a slight down right, yeah. Slight down right. And I would guess you're right-handed. It's a really long story about yes, yeah. but yes, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> that usually corresponds. Usually, if people are right or left-handed, the, that shoulder... That shoulder's dropped be down. The drop shoulder. Not always, but in most cases. There you go, a little bit of a tailoring lesson for you as well. When a young man named Shit, oops, sorry, prisoner of war camp in Holmzinden, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was over-egging the pudding on that one.